Hey there, Pastor Joel here. So glad you could join us virtually this morning. It is our prayer that by making our service available on Facebook and YouTube and other online options, that we are able to reach out and bless those who are otherwise providentially hindered from gathering in church. Now please note that this is in no way intended to serve as a replacement for actually being involved in a local church. For that is so important in the life of a believer to publicly gather for worship and the proclamation of the word. But we also realize that sometimes in life, things happen. We get sick or we lose our car. Just, you know, things happen. And that's where we hope that we can help out by still giving you a way to virtually hear the word proclaimed and, and sing a hymn at the end of the service. Or perhaps you can treat this time as a vitamin or a supplement. So you're still eating regular meals. You're still getting that meat. But maybe while you're jogging, you want to listen to a sermon or while driving to work. And in that way, we hope that you'll be blessed by this. So we're glad to have you with us. Uh, this is meant to be served as a, a supplement or a, a vitamin or a temporary fix, but, but nothing more. We hope you're still involved in a local church. But again, that all said, we're so glad to have you with us. We invite you to join us with us in person if that's possible and hope that you will be blessed by the gospel proclaimed. finish up this morning in Matthew chapter 6. Uh, we've spent the past several, probably two months, uh, not counting for Easter, in the Lord's model prayer and uh, deviated from that last Sunday. I had a lot on my heart that I wanted to share, uh, but we're going to wrap that up this week. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and reread the prayer in its entirety to set some context and then I'll in the first few minutes, reviewing how the former petitions all tie together, and then we'll move into the final petition, uh, which is new content, and draw that section of our sermon series to a close. Um, so if you've got a Bible and would like to follow along, we're in Matthew chapter 6. Uh, we'll read back from verse 9 and carry it on down through verse 13. So Matthew 6, 9 through 13. Therefore ye should pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we have forgiven those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Let's go to the Lord in one more quick word. Fathers, we prepare now to mine out truths from your word. I pray, God, that you hide me behind the cross and my many anxieties and inadequacies, God, I pray that you just crucify them now. And for those of us who, who have carried burdens into this building this morning, God, help us to check them at the door so we may come before you with an empty heart with eyes that are ready to see your truth, ears that are ready to hear it, and hearts that are ready to grasp it. And I pray, Father, as I always do, that people see you and your Son this morning, and not Joel. Father, hide me so that you may be mighty, so that you may be big. Help me to stand on an authority that is not my own, because, Father, I have none. God, we ask all of this for your glorification and for the hallowing of your name. And so we pray this in your holy name. And all of God's children said, Amen. So as I've already said, after breaking from the Sermon on the Mount for a few weeks for Easter, today is the seventh and final week that we will have been in the Lord's model prayer. You hoo hallelujah, right? We can, we can move on to new territory next week. We finish it today, and then we move on next week. So a little summary recap is needed. Uh, first, we, we contrasted this perfect model with the hypocritical prayers of fallen people like ourselves in verses 5 to 8. Right? Those were the common prayers in Israel in verses 5 to 8. Um, and then 
what's offered in verses 9 to 13 is offered as a corrective. Jesus says, therefore ye should pray like this, not like that, pray like this. Right? Those were prayers of fallen people. This is a prayer given to us by a perfect Savior who was without any mixture of error and is therefore a prayer uttered without the hindrances of sin. Right? Jesus was not hindered by sin whenever He approached the throne room of God as you and I are. When we approach the throne room of God, the temptation is there. Right? Sin is dogging at our heels. The temptation is there to think about ourselves and not about God. Jesus didn't have that. He was perfect. So we can trust that this is a prayer perfectly in line with the will of God, what God would pray. And as such, it should be treated as the ideal, right? the perfect blueprint. You don't build a house without a plan. You don't put together a design without a blueprint. This is the blueprint for prayer. This is the master copy. It's words as Scripture given by the Son are perfect and without error. This is the ideal from which we fashion our own prayers. So we already know from the preceding verses, verses 5 to 8, that our prayers shouldn't be little casual quips that we spontaneously just mumble through, right? It's just kind of half-hearted, mumble through them and get through it. Right? Our prayers should be thoughtful. They should be worshipful. They should be reverent. They should communicate sincere intent. And they should recognize, honor, and cherish the holiness of God. After all, right? if we understand the Gospel, we know that it took the Son of God literally dying so that you and I could approach the throne room of God without melting like a little wax figurine in front of a blast furnace because God is so holy. Let's not take that for granted. Let our prayers be well thought out, sincere, and let them cherish the holiness of God. The whole, as I pointed out a couple weeks ago, the whole Jesus is my boyfriend theology so prevalent in the 21st century has us as casual with our prayer life as sending a text message. And beloved, Jesus isn't your boyfriend. Jesus is God. Jesus is your Lord. Jesus is your Savior. So if that leaves you at a loss for words, then fear not. We have been given graciously a perfect blueprint of which to fashion our prayers after. We have been given words to pray which are perfectly in line with the will of the Father, spoken by the Son, and as Scripture we can guarantee are inerrant, infallible, and completely authoritative. These are good words to pray. These are perfect words to pray. So if we're looking for the words, Jesus says, therefore, ye should pray like this. And in this perfect, selfless, sinless, well-thought-out prayer, so far we have seen our need to recognize God's sovereignty by praying, our Father who art in heaven. Our need to align our priorities with God's main priority by praying, hallowed be thy name. We've expressed our desire for this to come about by praying, Thy kingdom come, and submitted ourselves to this work by praying, Thy will be done. Then we ask God to provide all we need to accomplish and complete this work by asking, Give us this day our daily bread. Sustain us in this work. Keep us in this work. Then lastly, we prayed for God to forgive us our trespasses, just as we forgave others their trespasses against us. And each of these petitions has served to further the primary head petition, the hallowing of the Father's name. Right, like a common thread running through the whole prayer, the hallowing of God's name over all the earth has been behind every petition, be it explicit or it's just implied. We ask for His kingdom to come. Why? So that His name may be hallowed. We ask for His will to be done, which is the preaching of the gospel to every nation, as stated in Matthew 24, 14, 28, 19 to 20, Acts 1, 8, and countless other passages. Why? So that His kingdom may come and His name may be hallowed. This will make it on earth as it is in heaven, so His name may be hallowed perfectly here as it is there. 
We pray for daily bread to sustain us physically and spiritually in this task of preaching the gospel over all the earth, thus bringing about His kingdom and thus hallowing God's name. But before we can ever be sustained in that work, we must first be forgiven and adopted into the heavenly family. So we ask, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Forgive us, God, so that we may do Your will, preach Your gospel, Your kingdom may come, and your name be hallowed. You see, every petition serves the main. So I'll, I'll run back through it. So, so God has mercy on us. He expresses forgiveness towards us in the person of Jesus Christ, but He doesn't leave us there. He continues to provide us our daily bread so that those who eat of the bread of life will never again hunger or thirst. He sustains us. He keeps us. Why? so that we may do His will and proclaim His gospel to the ends of the earth, so that His kingdom may come and His name may be hallowed. Keeping us on topic throughout the whole prayer is the primary petition. Father, may Your name be hallowed. Hallowed be Thy name. Your name be honored as holy. Now, I've, I've, I've said that just about every week we've been in this prayer. Because as we pray through this, I want that to be on our hearts. The end goal being the hallowing of God's name. So it may seem redundant, it may seem repetitive, but that's, that's on purpose. Uh, it's, it's, this week has been for tying the whole prayer together because this is the perfect model. This is the ideal. Even if we don't pray these words verbatim, word for word, which I encourage us to do daily, by the way. Pray it and mean it from your heart. It should also completely revolutionize the way that we format every other prayer that we pray. Modeling our prayers after Jesus' perfect model is like building a house on concrete rather than shifting sand. It is an unchanging blueprint. So even if you don't pray Jesus' words word for word, like I would encourage, then at the very least, seeing how it all ties together is very important and should revolutionize every other prayer we pray. Jesus intended for it to do just that. That's why it's called the Lord's Model Prayer. That's why He contrasted it with the incorrect prayers in verses 5 to 8, and said, therefore ye should not pray like that, rather pray like this. So we pray, God have mercy on us, express forgiveness towards us in the person of Jesus Christ, and continue to provide our daily bread. Sustain us. Keep us. Why? So that we may do your will and proclaim your gospel to the ends of the earth so that your kingdom may come and ultimately your name may be hallowed all the other, over all the earth. That is a prayer that is perfectly in line with the will of the Father. So, I hope we're caught up. That all said, today we pray the final petition in the words of the familiar King James. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Or as translations now render it, and do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now I need to explain uh, the, the nuance, the difference there, um, because my entire sermon is pretty much built on that nuance, so I have to explain it first. Um, I have, let me just say, I have much respect um, for the King James Version of the Bible Although it's not the oldest English translation, there are older translations out there. It's definitely the oldest still in use today. And I've been following it pretty closely throughout the whole prayer. However, over the course, I have to, I have to deviate on this last verse from it and use a different translation. Because over the course of the past 400 years that stand between the translators of 1611 and today, we've learned a lot about the ancient languages. Um, discovery of more old first century documents has taught us more about the Koine language and has led to more, I believe, a more accurate rendering of the evil one than we had in 1611. Um, rather than just evil, that's why if you have a more recent translation such as the CSB or the ESV, uh, given what we've learned about the ancient languages, um, they've, they've shifted that in recent years. Now say the evil one. Now that may seem like an insignificant difference, but it actually has major implications, as I'll explain. The original manuscript of Matthew says, and this is in your uh, thing there, it says, to Panaru. 
Now, that, mean, that doesn't mean anything to you. Look, if that looks like Greek to you, it's because it is, right? And it probably doesn't mean anything to you um, if you don't speak Greek. But Panaru, and there's, there's a reason for this. I, I promise I'm, I'm doing this for a reason. But Panaru is the word evil in the singular masculine. And the definite article that goes before that, too, in front of it, means that the following word, in this case, Panaru, must take a form called the genitive form, meaning the word is taking possession of something. It's taking possession of something. A masculine, singular something, which the definite article puts in the genitive form. It's singular, too. It's not in the plural form. It's singular. And it must be either masculine or neuter because it ends with an upsilon, the way the Greek language works. I don't tell you that to make myself sound educated, I promise, because I'm not. Okay? I'm not. I'm just a redneck farm boy from the Midwest. I, I promise you. Rather, I explain that to raise the question. If we could personify evil and use it in the singular, not plural. Panaru is in the singular, not plural. And use it to describe something or somebody which must be in the masculine or neuter form. Who would that be? Who, who would it be taking possession of? So we've got the word evil in the singular, taking possession of something in either the masculine or neuter form. Who would that apply to? Satan. Right? Yo, I, didn't have to, I had a hint in my notes. I didn't have to give it to you. Y'all figured it out. You're smarter than me. <laughs> so, here's, so we see the exact same construction in Matthew 13 in the parable of the wheat and the weeds. The exact same. Two Ponaru appears there too. Same construction. The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed, these are the children of the kingdom. The weeds, are the, the weeds are the children of the evil one. Tu Panaru, same construction, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. So we know that this temptation is flowing from not just general, vague evil, but the evil one. And the enemy who sowed it is the devil. This is a very specific petition. Two Panaru, same construction. And here, the evil one, evil personified, is explicitly described as the devil himself. So instead of just deliver us from evil, as was the understood interpretation at one time, we now believe Jesus to have said something more like deliver us from the evil. One, which may seem like a relatively insignificant difference, but it actually changes the entire meaning of the petition. It's not just general, vague evil from which we desire deliverance, but evil personified. The devil himself. Deliver us from the evil one. Look, if all good things come from the Father of lights, as James said, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, who does not change like the shifting shadows. Then we know that all evil and bad must come from the devil. It's not just this general evil that exists in creation because that would assert that it came from God. And then we have a major, we draws into question God's character. Can God really be good? Rather, it is satanic temptations that come from the devil that we are talking about here. And this is really quite necessary to understanding the final petition of the prayer. It answers a lot of questions about God's goodness and virtue. Because if this evil that we are praying for deliverance from didn't come from the evil one himself, Satan, we'd have quite a problem. We would be praying for God not to lead us into his own temptations as if God can tempt. This would lead us into a serious moral dilemma. Can God really do that? Can a holy, righteous, pure, undefiled, blameless, unblemished, virtuous God possibly lead anyone into temptation? Wouldn't that seem to negate what James said in James 1.13? Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God can neither be tempted, nor does God ever tempt any man. So how could a holy, virtuous, and righteous God be the author of such evil? 
How could he lead his sheep into temptation? What kind of shepherd does that? It would make Jesus' claims in John 10 prove to be a farce. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The hired hand, since he is not the shepherd and doesn't own the sheep, leaves them and runs away when he sees a wolf coming. The wolf then snatches them and scatters them. This happens because he is a hired hand and doesn't care about the sheep. But I am the good shepherd, Jesus says. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. Would a good shepherd lead his own sheep to destruction? Would a good shepherd tempt his sheep with death? James 1.13 says, certainly not, for God can neither be tempted nor does God ever tempt man. So how in the world can we pray, Lord, don't tempt us, when the Bible says He never will anyway? Unless we acknowledge that the temptations we are praying for deliverance from are from the evil one. Satan himself. Otherwise, we've got quite a dilemma there. Although, and I, this, this is moving into another point here in our outline. Although, and some of you might already be a step ahead of me and, and be saying this in your mind, there is a sense where God allows our temptations that Satan brings our way and uses our temptations. Right? That does happen. Look to Job, for instance. Some of you might have already went there. And if so, you're, you're on it. You're smart. I give you A+. a plus. That's awesome. Satan couldn't as much... That's interesting, though. Satan couldn't as much as touch Job without first getting God's permission. First getting God's allowance. And even then, what God do? He set parameters, right? Okay, you can do this, but don't touch Job himself. Things where Satan could not touch. You know what this gives the imagery of? Where evil comes from. It's like a chained dog. It's like a vicious dog, right? It's, it's a dog that will bite, it will kill, it will devour, and it will steal. It's a mean dog. But it's a dog on a chain nonetheless. All God has to do is give the chain a little tug, and Satan has no choice but to lay down. And at the end, all God will have to do is give it a little toss, and into the lake of fire the dog will go. He's on a leash, and God's got the end. With this imagery in mind is how we can understand 1 Corinthians 10.13, and therefore better understand what we are asking in this petition. No temptation has come upon you except what is common to humanity. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. But with the temptation, He will also provide the way out so that you may be able to bear it. So, James says that God does not tempt. Let us never say that God is tempted or that He tempts man. Okay, we got that. However, Paul expands on this idea. He elaborates on it in his letter to the Corinthians that God does allow us to be tempted. He, does, he isn't the one doing it. And He will never allow any more temptation to come our way other than what we can bear. Should it get close, He'll give that leash a tug and Satan will learn his lesson, just like with Job. And here's the really cool thing, too. In the cases that God does allow it, he always has a bigger and better reason for doing it that will trump Satan's evil, mischievous reasons. Right? Satan is not God. He doesn't have omniscience. He can't see the future. He doesn't know what's coming. God can see the end result. He can see what that's gonna, the fruit that's going to bear. And so even when God allows Satan to do his thing to a limited capacity, God always has something in mind for the end. It's always purposed. Job said, when he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. James 1 says, count it all joy when you enter a trial, because trials have their perfect work. Peter said, in this you rejoice that now for a little while you have to suffer various trials so that the genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, may redound to praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, the temptation is to prove the genuine gold of your faith. 
God's purpose is always for good. He wants to show off His grace. He wants to show off His work. In a sense, if you're being tempted, if God's allowing it, God wants to show you off. He wants to develop you and mature you. But Satan tries to turn it for evil. Whenever Satan was roaming about on the earth, and attention was drawn to Job, it was God saying to Satan, have you noticed my servant Job? No one else on earth is like him. A man of perfect integrity who fears God and turns away from evil. God is bragging on his faithful. Let me show off my servant. Because he's mine. Look look, Look at him. I want to show him off. So God, who searches hearts, knows Job's limitations. He knows what Job can bear. He sets those parameters, and he never allows Satan to tempt him beyond that. He's got Satan on a leash. And in the end, after the period of trials and temptations are over, Job is richly blessed beyond measure. God is glorified, and Satan learns his lesson and is put in his place. So summing up to this point, what are we saying? Trials and temptations, God allows, doesn't bring, but He allows as tests to prove your strength, exercise your spiritual muscle, and develop your spiritual strength. And while God does allow these things, these temptations never come from Him. They are always from the evil one, Satan. And trust, but trust that if God is allowing it though, He has a reason and a purpose for it. This is why God will never allow His children to suffer more than we can bear and get out of. God is in control, not Satan. God is sovereign, not Satan. Satan may buck, he may holler, and he may cause a scene, but God always has the last word, and His words and works always have a purpose. They're never meaningless. They're never random. Now, do you want to see something really cool? This will make God look just so big and awesome to you. This means, if we believe the truths that we have just explained from Scripture, this means that the Lord has to work out your whole life. God has to work out your whole life because there are certain things, there are certain trials and temptations that will come your way and that you need to face down and grow from. But if they came at the wrong time, if God allowed them to come at the wrong time while you were still too young in the faith, or maybe while you were backslidden, you couldn't handle them. And instead of growing from them, you would fall to them. Right? You wouldn't have a way out. For example, there are certain temptations that come to me now that I could have never dealt with as a teenager. Never. And I'm sure there will be temptations that come to me in 20 years that I'm not prepared to face now. But as I have been strengthened, I am able to deal with more now than I did just 10 short years ago. The Lord has ordered our whole life so that at no point our life will ever be tempted in a situation where you and I do not have the strength to resist the temptation that is facing us. This is how he is able to ensure that no temptation has come upon you except what is common to humanity. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to bear it. This assumes that God has ordered our whole lives to make this possible. This is what it means whenever we say that he is God himself who keeps us. This is a part of of God's keeping us. This is a part of God finishing the work that He started in us, maturing us, sanctifying us, growing us in trials and tribulations, all while ensuring that we don't succumb and fall to them. And this is all a part of His working us towards the finished product which we shall be in glory. So we can say with Job, when He has tried me, I shall come forth as Gold. This is thanks to the trials that God allows to perfect us. Trials that God allows to help us 
strengthen others. Trials that God allows to teach us to trust Him. Trials that God allows to drive us to the Word of God and to our knees. But trials which God will always ensure are never stronger than our faith at any given time. He will always provide a way out so that we can bear it and grow from them. So that if we succumb to that trial and we succumb to that temptation, we are without excuse. It's not God's fault. He provided a way out. And it is here that, referencing the parallel and the Beatitudes, one who has been broken and made poor in spirit, who mourns over their sin, made humble and meek, one who was emptied of themselves so as to hunger and thirst for righteousness so that they may be filled with daily bread and made merciful, forgiving others as they have been forgiven. It is here that they now begin to understand what it means to be made pure of heart. I love the parallel between this and the Beatitudes continues. It's a process. It's a refining process which God is working out for the good of His children. That is what a shepherd does. A good shepherd. So when the prayer says, lead us not into temptation, the implication is, Lord, don't ever let us be brought into a temptation which will be so big that we will not be able to resist it. Rather, deliver us from anything that would subject us to Satan and the evil one. Don't put us over to a power and scheme of the enemy that we can't handle. And we know that God won't, right? We are, we are merely making a claim of promise. James, Paul, and countless biblical authors have assumed, and so it must be assumed here too, that God does not tempt us at all or even allow us to be tempted beyond what we can bear. A holy, sinless, absolutely righteous God is not going to incite us to sin. He's not going to allure us into sin. He's not going to tempt us into sin. But He will allow Satan to bring those things into our lives that become tests for us, because even those God uses for good. In other words... This petition is not so rational as it is emotional. We know God won't tempt us. We know God won't even allow His children a temptation beyond what they can bear. And even that will be used for good. Rather, this is the cry of a heart that despises and hates even the potential of sin. One who understands what it now means to be pure of heart. It's a heart that hates the possibility of sin. The utterance of a heart that so severely wants to see the coming kingdom consummated, sin and death crushed, and God's name hallowed, that at the end of the prayer, we conclude and we cry out in a personal plea, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. It's not so much a rational plea as it is an emotional plea, because we know that God won't, and He will. So we cry out at the end of the prayer, because we hate the potential of sin. We want to see the kingdom consummated, sin and death crushed, and God's name hallowed. By the way, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ asked the same thing of the Father in His high priestly prayer in John 17, 15, when He prayed, Father, I ask not that You take them out of the world, but that while they're in the world, You keep them from the evil one. By the way, He said to Panaru there, the same thing that we say in his model prayer. To Panaru. Don't let them fall into the hands of or into the power of the evil one. Martin Luther said, we cannot help being exposed to the assaults, but we pray that we may not fall and perish under them. End quote. And that's the essence of it. It's a prayer for God to defend us, to strengthen us, and mature us in times of temptation. So Satan does not turn it into something irresistible and draw us into lust and sin. Another commentator, Charles Quarles, wrote, The disciple is not so weak that he is no match for the devil. He needs a savior, not an assistant. A hero, not a helper. He needs a champion who will fight the evil one for him and who will snatch him from the clutches of the enemy who seeks to kill, steal, and destroy and that's what the Good Shepherd does. And so we are led through this refining process 
all while being protected from the evil one, who is Satan, delivered from sin and temptation, our debts forgiven, our daily bread given, so we may do His will and preach His gospel to the end of the earth, so that His kingdom may come and His name be hallowed. All of this, not some of this, is for the glory of God. All of this, not some of this, is for the glory of God. Every trial we are pulled through is for your edification and God's glory. Every sin we are forgiven of is for the glory of God. All of this so that we may do the will of God, bring His kingdom, and glorify Him forever. Every petition serves the former. This final petition of the Lord's model prayer is crucial in our, for our success in spiritual warfare. This request is a wartime cry for protection and guidance. For without ending the prayer on this note, we could never fulfill the heart of the prayer, which is hallowing God's name over all the earth. You don't build a house without a plan. You don't put together a design without a blueprint. This is the blueprint for prayer. This is the master copy. Its words, as Scripture, given by the Son, are perfect and without error. This is the ideal from which we fashion our own prayers. And in this perfect, selfless, sinless, well-thought-out prayer, so far we have seen our need to recognize God's sovereignty by praying, Our Father who art in heaven, our need to align our priorities with God's main priority by praying, hallowed be thy name. We've expressed our desire for this to come about by praying, thy kingdom come, and submitted ourselves to this work by praying, thy will be done. Then we ask God to provide all we need to accomplish and complete this work by praying, give us this day our daily bread. Right? Sustain us in this work, keep us in this work, Then we pray for God to forgive us our trespasses just as we forgive those who trespass against us. And today, we ask in an emotional plea with a heart that so longingly wants to see that kingdom consummated, sin and death crushed, and God's name hallowed, that at the end of the prayer, we cry out in a personal plea, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Have victory over Satan and over our sin Yank that chain and hallow your name. So in summary, we wrap all this up. Just watch how each petition works to serve the former. God keeps us through our trials. He protects us from the evil one and from Satan. He has mercy on us and expresses forgiveness towards us in the person of Jesus Christ. But he doesn't leave us there, y'all. He continues to provide your daily bread. He sustains you. He keeps you. Why? So that you may do His will and proclaim His gospel to the ends of the earth so that His kingdom may come and His name may be hallowed. Like a common thread running through the whole prayer, holding the whole thing together, keeping us on topic, is the main idea. Father, may Your name be hallowed. Hallowed be Thy name. Your name be honored. It's holy. So we pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And if y'all would, we're going to close out by singing hymn number four. 62, love lifted me. And as we do, this altar is open. If we would like to come forward this morning, if the Holy Spirit has been working in our life, and it's, we need to come forward and ask for God's protection. And we've got something going on in our life right now that's really maybe weighing hard on us. And we want to seek God, make that petition of promise that we know that God will deliver us if we are His. Or maybe you're not His. Maybe we haven't lived with faith in Christ alone. And we need to get that straight first. But then by all means, please please talk to me or 
come forward. One of the deacons would, would love to pray with you. Um, I don't want anybody to leave here this morning not knowing the truths that we've talked about. So if we would, let's please rise and sing. by praying together. That's the third Sunday of Easter. I'll open up with that. And then as we close out together, I invite you to pray the Lord's model prayer together. With me. Oh, Almighty God, you gave your only son, Jesus, to be for us both a sacrifice for sin and an example of godly living. Give us grace, thankfully, to receive his inestimable benefits and daily to follow the blessed steps of his holy life through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. And God, we ask all of this, ultimately, as we have prayed repeatedly this morning, Father, for the hallowing of your name. Lift us up by your love. Protect us from the evil one by your love. And help us, God, to trust that whenever we face various trials and temptations, God, that you have something good in store for us. And that you, by your grace, give us the faith to resist. Oh God, may we find our strength in you and in you alone. Trusting that everything that comes our way, God, you have provided a way out of. And Father, if anybody in here this morning does not know that grace or is not living with that faith, then Father, I pray specifically for them now. Open their heart by your Holy Spirit. Regenerate their soul. Give them your Holy Spirit so that they may cry out to you, Lord, Lord, and call upon your holy name and find salvation in you. Oh God, that's my prayer for anybody in here who does not know you. And for anybody in here who does, but who's been living outside of your graces or outside of the church. And Father, I pray that you draw them back to our first love. For we serve a resurrected Savior. And nothing matters more. Oh, Father, you are, you are God. You are our Lord and Savior. Protect us, lead us, and deliver us. We ask all of this 
for your glory and in your holy name. And if you'd all please pray with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And all of God's children said, Amen. Amen. Just a quick reminder, um, tonight at 6 is our monthly church conference, and at 7 we'll be in chapter 8, covering Providence. Looking forward to a great discussion with you all this evening. And we're still taking the Annie Armstrong offering if you'd like to give. The envelopes are on the foyer table, and the collection basket is in the foyer as well. Y'all, God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. And let's close out with our song.